Hey, welcome, uh, everybody. Uh, my name is Harvey Dong, and I'm a lecturer in Asian American and Asian Diaspora Studies. And this semester, I'm teaching uh, Chinese American history. And I want to welcome today uh, three guest speakers, uh, William Dare, Alvin Jaw, and Jean Dare. And they're going to talk about their family experience uh, with regards to the Cold War during the 1950s all the way up to the mid 1960s, the effects of the Cold War on Chinese American families. Uh, this is part of a uh, spring uh, Chinese American history series. Uh, the first speaker that we had was Jenny Lim, uh, second, uh, Bruce Kwan Jr. And today we'll have William, Jeannie, and Alvin. Uh, and also on May 7th, uh, st uh, students are making uh, 10 podcast projects uh, on different subjects and topics, uh, interviewing community members. And we'll be having a showing on May 7th, 2021 at the same channel uh, that you're on today, but it'll be on Friday, 1 to 3 p.m and you're all invited. Uh, this series is sponsored by Asian American Asian Diaspora Studies at UC Berkeley with support by the Chinese Alumni Association chapter of UC Berkeley and also the Ethnic Studies Changemaker Program. Uh, books related to this speaker series can be found at East, East Wind Books of Berkeley, www asiabookcenter.com. Uh, the last book there, Stand Up Archive History of the Asian American Movement by the Asian Community Center Archive Group uh, features some of the topics that will be discussed today. So the first speaker to, to talk will be Jean Deere. Jeannie, you wanna take over? Okay, uh, what I'm going to do is talk about some history of why the Red Scare happened. So um, during the MacArthur era, or the Red Scare in the 1950s, one of the groups targeted by the FBI in Chinatown was Munching, a youth group my father had been with for 10 years. In 1939, when my father was 16 years old, he was sent to the US to escape war. Hundreds of other families who were able to also send their children to safety. Japan invaded Ch China and now occupied the, Can the Canton area, the Pearl River Delta region where most of the Chinese living in America had come from. After the US entered the Second World War, my father would join the US military as did more than 12,000 Chinese Americans but he would be persecuted during the Red Scare. So why did this happen? I will list two things. The first thing was the victory of the revolution led by Mao and the Communist Party in China in 1949. And the second thing was the reaction in the US Congress. The politicians were demanding an answer to the question of who lost China? So, why would they even ask such a question? Did China belong to the US? Here's some history. From 1854 to 1949, a total of 95 years, the US had gunboats sailing up and down the Yangtze River from Shanghai up to Wuhan. American merchants had traded in opium in China. It wasn't just the uh, British. Britain had a monopoly on opium from India, so the Americans got their opium from Turkey. They made huge fortunes shipping illegal drugs into China. These fortunes provided the funds for the US to industrialize. They invested in coal and copper mining, textile factories, railroads, and more. After the Opium War, Europe and the US forced unequal treaties on China. Foreigners had more rights than the Chinese people in, in, in their own country. The US wanted an open door to China, but closed the door to the Chinese. 
to enter the U.S. passing the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882. Then during the Second World War, U.S. became allied with China. I won't have time to talk about Europe and, and European co colonies in Asia and Southeast Asia. But what happened was in China, U.S. backed the Kuomintang Party under Chiang Kai-shek to fight the Japanese. Later, the, the U.S. would also back the KMT in the civil war against the communists, fighting from 1945 to 1949. The U.S. handed more than $3 billion to Chiang Kai-shek and his government over two decades. When the KMT lost the civil war, they retreated to the island of Taiwan. Many of the China experts who work for the U.S. State Department had been warning their government that if there was a civil war, the communists would win. One of these experts was John Service. He had visited the communist liberated areas. He saw, he saw how Mao's land reform policies brought a better life to the people. He also saw that the Red Army was successful in waging people's war using guerrilla warfare to defeat much larger armies and how millions of peasants supported the communists. The KMT, on the other hand, was corrupt and e inefficient. And he, in his report, he wrote that the KMT was fascist, undemocratic, and feudal. John Service relayed to the U.S. government that Mao would like to establish relationship with the U.S. and that they could cooperate for mutual benefit. But the U.S. politicians would not listen. After the KMT forces were defeated, the U.S. refused to recognize the People's Republic of China and the 4 billion people on the mainland. Instead, they considered the Taiwan Island government under Chiang Kai-shek to be the real China. Some of the Chinese living in the U.S. welcomed the founding of a new China. For them, a new China represented hope, the hope for an end to foreign oppression, exploitation, poverty, and corruption. It was due to a weak China that U.S. was even able to pass the Chinese Exclusion Act. There was a celebration held in the San Francisco Chinatown to celebrate the People's Republic of China. The KMT sent their agents to disrupt the meeting. Since the 1920s, the KMT had a strong presence in, in all of the Chinese overseas communities and had made great effort to maintain control of the Chinatown establishment, like the Six Company and the Family Association. In the 1950s, the KMT would set up anti-communist leagues in Chinatowns, and they expected these associations to participate. The U.S. government started to look at the Chinese living in the U.S. for suspicion, just like how they did with the Japanese during World War II. Even sending money home to family in China Something done for decades came to be seen as trading with the enemy. For the U.S. government, the success of the revolution in China under Mao represented the spread of the Soviet communist bloc. In the beginning of 1950, a senator named Joseph MacArthur, McCarthy began to come up with accusa accusations of communist infiltration in, in government departments and agencies. John Service and other China experts came under suspicion too, and they were put under investigation and lost their jobs. Later in September of that year, the McCarran in Internal Security Act, also called the Concentration Camp Act was passed it would be used to target communists and other subversives. This was the start of the Red Scare and a witch hunt was started, not only against communists or communist party members, 
but also people like union leaders, unionized workers, civil rights leaders, progressive lawyers, Hollywood actors and writers. A particular big target was overseas Chinese students and scientists. And I'm going to stop here and let uh, the other speakers talk more. Next will be Alvin Ja. Hi, um, yeah. Um, what I'd like to do is, first of all, uh, thank Jeannie for her uh, historical background. Uh, I can't emphasize enough that context matters in how we see the world. It's important to know uh, history and the context to understand all the, um, all the, basically all the propaganda that's going on against China right now. Uh, anyway, um, uh, Jeannie brought up uh, the, the idea about Chinese Americans uh, supporting China. Uh, my father, his name was uh, Qiu Yun Jia, uh, was very important in Chinatown in uh, supporting uh, the new China. Um, he was very outspoken and very much in a minority. Um, uh, one of the things about him was that even though he was uh, active um, in supporting New China and the traditional organizations were basically uh, anti-communist, uh, he was deeply involved uh, in the traditional organizations. Uh, one of the reasons for that was that he was uh, highly educated. He went to uh, Sun Yat-sen University in uh, Guangzhou, uh, Zhongshan uh, Daiha, a very um, reputable, um, uh, high esteem uh, uh, university in, in Canton. So uh, because of that, uh, he was very highly respected uh, within the traditional organizations. Uh, he was a representative of, uh, uh, as part of the six companies. Uh, he was very active in the family associations. Uh, as was uh, William and Jeannie's parent, uh, father. Uh, we were, well, we both have the, we all have the same last name and uh, we're all from Hoi Ping. Um, so anyway, um, this slide that you see right here, uh, I don't know the exact uh, uh, event that it took place in. Uh, it shows uh, in the backdrop, a sign that says uh, trade, friendship, recognition. And this was what he was uh, uh, espousing uh, with the other pro-China forces, uh, uh, basically the idea of friendship with the new China and recognition of the, of the new China. Uh, in addition to that, uh, he was um, a newspaper writer. Actually, he, he managed a newspaper, but it died eventually uh, during the Korean War. Um, uh, but he, after that, he wrote for the uh, Chinese world. Uh, it's called uh, uh, Sai Ga Yat Bo, uh, that was published in, in Chinatown. Uh, next slide, please. Harvey, next slide. Okay, so uh, this is something I just picked up from Wikipedia, and I'll just read it. Okay, the formal establishment of the PRC in 1949 and the beginning of the Korean War in 1950 meant that Asian Americans, especially those of Chinese or Korean descent, came under increasing suspicion by both American civilians and government officials of being China communist sympathizers. Uh, next slide. Okay, um, so. Um, what we have here, and Jeannie talked about the idea of the loss of China, um, uh, the establishment of the PRC, the Korean War, and the, uh, and the McCarthy area, era, excuse me. Uh, so, um, there, uh, once again, uh, there, there's this idea of the loss of China, and the term of the loss of China is revealing. You can only lose something if you own it. The U.S. does not own China, but the uh, background or the mentality behind this kind of thinking is reflective of an overarching attitude of 
Western superiority that exists even right now. Americans in the West have this fundamental attitude of white superiority, and uh, that is why the US, Australia, Canada, Britain, Europe justifies telling the rest of the world what they should be thinking and what they should be doing. It's a missionary, evangelical, crusader attitude that justified the colonization of Africa, Asia, and the Americas. Okay. Um, anyway, there were accusations, and uh, Jeannie already talked about, um, that there were communist sympathizers in the State Department that had enabled the communist victory. And that formed the basis for the Red Scare. Uh, the House on American Activities held hearings across the country looking for subversives. Uh, the Korean War uh, put uh, U.S. and Chinese military forces going head to head. And with this Red Scare subversive narrative, uh, Chinese Americans were targeted as a fifth column. Uh, next slide. Okay. So KMT, uh, Kuomintang, the nationalists, uh, were a very influential in Chinatown. Uh, one of the reasons was that, um, yeah, you know, uh, the people in the U.S. made money, uh, you know, made hard, tough money and sent it back to China. But in China, uh, because the living standards were so, so low, uh, the families that received these overseas remittances were considered uh, relatively wealthy. And uh, after the takeover uh, of, of uh, China by the communists, uh, they instituted land reform programs. And basically, a lot of overseas families were uh, victims of land reform. So that, that's another reason why the, the pro-communist feeling uh, was stronger than, uh, excuse me, the anti-communist feeling in, in Chinatown was stronger than the pro-China uh, 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 feelings. And basically, uh, people like my father, William and Jeannie's father, were in a very small minority. They, they were really uh, fighting the odds. Okay, uh, next, next slide, please. Okay, um, after uh, the PRC was declared, uh, people in Chinatown, the pro, the pro China, uh, pro New China uh, people, uh, set up a program to celebrate uh, the founding of the Republic uh, of China, People's Republic of China. It took place at on Stockton Street at the Chinese Citizens Alliance Association, the KMT sent in thugs and, and uh, broke up the, tried to break up the program, although it did uh, reform uh, after, after the, um, the, the minor rioting. Um, uh, the next day, um, China, uh, Chinatown saw this um, uh, hit list um, in the streets. Uh, it was distributed, distributed, and basically uh, it says, um, I, I have the translation on the, on the left, eliminate local traders. Patriotic overseas Chinese should love and protect the Republic of China. We must all rise up to eliminate those traitorous communist bandits uh, circulated by the Republic of China Protection Group. Uh, in case people aren't familiar, uh, Nationalist China, uh, the KMT China, uh, called themselves the Republic of China, as opposed to the um, Mao's China is called the People's Republic of China. Anyway, there, there are 15 names uh, among them. Uh, actually, the first on the list is, is my father's name. Uh, it includes students. Uh, it includes businessmen. Uh, it, it includes um, uh, people from uh, New York. Uh, basically, uh, this, these were the people that the KMT felt uh, were the leaders in, in the pro-China pro um, uh, activities. Uh, next slide. Okay. Uh, so my father's point of view was that the Communist Party made things better for the people of China and achieved the country's independence. Uh, he was not advocating for the over, overthrow of the 
U.S. and uh, neither was Mun Ching or uh, or or, or the uh, uh, William and Jeannie's father. Um, he did believe in justice for the dispossessed. So that picture that you see uh, is my father uh, speaking at an international hotel rally. So um, during that time, there was a wave of eviction activities. Um, and um, this was one of them at which my, my father spoke. Um, but there are uh, parallels today, to, today in terms of how Chinese are being seen as subversives. Uh, uh, there's Chinese fifth column working in academia. That's why there's this campaign called the China, China Initiative uh, uh, that's uh, established by the Department of Justice and the FBI to look for spies, so-called spies, you know, uh, and in the Chinese communities. And there are uh, several documents uh, uh, to support this kind of campaign against uh, Chinese, so-called Chinese subversives. Uh, Newsweek had a had an article uh, about. Um, Traditional family, uh, traditional Chinese organizations um, uh, uh, being uh, locations where uh, China would try to um, recruit spies, basically. Uh, Hoover Institution put out a document of several years ago, once again, talking about the Chinese communities and um, how they could be a, a nest of spies. Uh, there was an article in Politico several years ago uh, that uh, talked about uh, a, a, a spy in Feinstein's office. And actually, a lot of us know who that person is. I won't name his name. Uh, but that Politico uh, article was just a bunch of innuendo. Uh, they would quote unnamed FBI sources saying that um, Silicon Valley basically a host a den of spies. And I, I think I'm done here. Uh, I think uh, William is up now. William? Yeah. yeah. Uh, William? Hey. Yeah. OK, so I'm going to give a, uh, I guess, the uh, story of what happened to our, our dad, who uh, was a member of Manqing. Um, and uh, he was not just the only one that was persecuted and prosecuted by the uh, US government, but this is just one example. So my father was born in 1923 in uh, Winglonglei, Hoiping, China, in the Canton province or Guangdong. And uh, at age 11 in 1933, uh, he came over to the United States as a third generation sojourner following his father and grandfather. This was due to the uh, 1882 uh, Chinese Exclusion Act, which prevented uh, Chinese from bringing families over or raising a family in the United States. So even though he is third generation, they, they all had, they were never uh, able to actually raise a family here. Anyway, he stayed for 10 months. My dad stayed for 10 months and returned in 1934 to China to continue his Chinese education. In 1939, he came back to the US at age 16 when the Japanese invasion of China reached Southern China. And uh, in uh, October of 1942, he enlisted in the US Army Air Force. He became an aircraft mechanic and served as a Chinese interpreter during training of Chinese cadets from China. He was honorably discharged in uh, February, of uh, February 28, 1946. And in 1947, he, he left the uh, yeah, United States again to uh, visit relatives and to find a wife you know, basically get married, which is the same story that occurred for most of the uh, Chinese of that generation. In 1948, he returned with his wife, Emmy, our mother. In 1940, my father had joined a leftist organization named the New Chinese Alphabetized Language Society. Uh, you saw a picture of him standing in front of the club uh, that Jeannie showed earlier. It promoted alphabetization of Chinese to make the language easier to learn and therefore more accessible to the people of China to help wipe out illiteracy there. Uh, during the war years, the group would change its name to Chinese Youth for National Salvation. And then finally, after the war, it would be renamed Chinese American Democratic Youth League or Manqing. 
he would stay a member until his disbandment around 1960. As Jeannie mentioned in her introduction, the Red Scare and the rise of McCarthyism in the 1950s brought about an atmosphere of paranoia and fear as the government started to root out leftists and alleged communist sympathizers from the government positions and so forth. And due to the quote, again, loss of China, unquote, and its close association with the nationalist government of Taiwan, the US government planned to do the same with the pro-Chinese leftists with who in their eyes posed a security threat. In the late 1950s, according to immigration agents, the US Immigration Service had compiled a secret list of Chinese organizations that were deemed as suspect subversive groups that had political ideas not compatible with the capitalist system for the sole purpose of prosecution of his members. Munching was probably on top of that list. The US Attorney General in 1956 set up a so-called confession program to, to uh, discriminately use as a means to root out and expose certain members of leftist organizations for prosecution and deportation. The confession program was supposed to be a, open to voluntary participation uh, so that, you know, if you're a uh, Chinese person that came over and uh, illegally, basically using paper names, which I'll talk about later, you can confess and, ho and hopefully you'll be um, allowed to uh, resettle in the U.S. as a citizen after uh, confessing your, 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 um, your true name, your true family tree and so forth. But by doing that, you actually have to expose everybody that's involved in, in your uh, supposed fraud. So it's a very, very uh, dangerous uh, position for a lot of Chinese to uh, admit if they had to confess. So anyway, the attorney general and the FBI used this confession program as a means to go after activists and leftists. The confession program uh, itself was a byproduct of the 1982 Exclusion Act because it barred entry of Chinese in general the act forced Chinese to use extreme measures to gain entry into the United States. This included the use of paper names that were documents that represented sons of Chinese, US citizens of Chinese descent. These paper names were often sold to those with the means to immigrate to this country. And in fact, was the most common method to immigrate to the U US for Chinese citizens. This includes my father who came over using the name Kai Gay Deer, which is his paper name. And his true name was Wing Jung Deer. That's why you see his name, uh, these two names used in a lot of uh, articles and even in the uh, uh, le legal documents that were uh, used to uh, prosecute him. The FBI would ring doorbells, you know, talk to kids in playgrounds, tell lies to provoke and intimidate Chinese Americans to obtain information that would expose a person as a paper son. The targeted individual would can then be indicted on immigration violations. So I can remember during that period, there was a lot of fear and anxiety within our family. You know, we were told not to speak to strangers, especially white people. And if the FBI came to our door, we were not to answer any questions. And in fact, we noticed there were arguments and estrangement between our relatives. And I believe that there were relatives that we didn't see for years because of the resentment and feelings of betrayal that was left as a result of the persecution by the US government. In fact, there were documented accounts of individuals who committed suicide rather than confess. As a result of the pressure and harassment by the FBI, confessions were obtained from some of our relatives. And my father was indicted by the San Francisco grand jury in March, 1961 on three counts. Count number one, was that he knowingly falsified and concealed information regarding his identity to enter and reside in the United States. Count two, that he conspired with uh, two or more people to defraud the United States to commit an offense against the US government. Number three, he knowingly made false representations in the naturalization proceedings of his wife, Emmy Deer. Okay, these indictments meant, okay, Harvey showed the next uh, slide. So he saw the indictment earlier. Uh, the next slide, please. These indictments meant uh, public exposure and shaming by the local conservative press. You can see in these uh, photos here, there are many articles, and there's only a couple here, but have a whole bunch of other ones that actually named him, 
showing that he was indicted and so forth. And they were all spread out in like the Chinese Pacific Weekly. Uh, next next uh, slide. The ACL, the ACL newsletter also, oops, keep going to the next one. Yeah, the ACLU newsletter also mentioned uh, his name and also the People's World newspaper also mentions his name in the uh, paper regarding this case because it was considered this case was considered a test case for other members of the uh, of the club. So after my father, many other members were also charged and prosecuted. Before the trial, the defense made a motion to dismiss the charges because the prosecutor had discriminated against my father's political beliefs and activities in violation of the guarantee of due process under the law and the guarantee of freedom of speech and assembly under the fifth, first and fifth amendments. The motion was denied and the case proceeded to trial on August 28th, 1961. It was a trial without a jury presided by Judge Albert C. Wollenberg. The first two charges were dismissed because the statute of limitations had run, run its course on those two because the, uh, the violations occurred in 1933. So our father was tried on the third count that of acting as a witness to my mother's naturalization hearing. My father testified that he, has, he was always considered, he always considered himself as a US citizen because he had received his certificate of identity issued to him by the immigration service at the age of 11 when he came over. It certified that he was a citizen of the US and that certif uh, certificate had never been canceled nor was there ever a demand for him to surrender it. Nevertheless, he was judged to be guilty as charged and he was sentenced to five years in the penitentiary. Sentence was to be suspended and he be put on probation for five years, conditioned upon him making arrangements to depart the US within a reasonable time, quote, say 60 days, unquote. That's what the judge asked, said, 60 days. Of course, this caused all kinds of worry and confusion in our family. Are we all going to have to leave the United States? What happens if our father is deported? How will we survive? An appeal was filed to put my dad in December of 1962, but that appeal was rejected. My father did not get deported because there was no diplomatic relations between the United States and China, and Taiwan would not accept a deportation of a leftist. So my dad became a stateless person or an alien with no passport, without the ability to leave and return to the US. Next slide, please. You see here that um, my dad had to be under supervision. Every year he had to report this to the immigration service as an alien. Uh, so he lost his passport. He couldn't, couldn't leave the country and return. So uh, when our mom wanted to travel to China to see her father for the last time, she had to travel without our dad. So besides the emotional and psychological toll, the entire episode also had an economic impact on the family due to the legal costs to fight the charges. My father had always believed that the legal prosecution of members of Manqing was a tactic to apply economic hardship to them as additional pressure to quit the club, confess, or leave the country. So basically that's the story of the uh, prosecution and persecution by the government on on our father. Okay, next. I think we go back to Alvin now. Okay, um, what um, all of us has talked about uh, actually has great relevance to today. Um, for a while, um, the thinking in the U.S. was that, uh, oh, okay, uh, China has been folded into the uh, world global uh, capitalist economy. So, uh, it's going to change and uh, make everything favorable and um, uh, uh, for the for the US and uh, everybody's going to get along because uh, China is going to become a democracy. So there, there, there was that kind of idea. But uh, what happened in China is that even though they made some uh, major changes in the direction of um, political thought and ideology uh, to incorporate uh, private enterprise. Um, the fundamental 
thinking of the leadership uh, although I, it, it has wavered back and forth because uh, there was a time when uh, it was getting closer and closer to the American uh, economic model. But more recently, uh, China has uh, taken on uh, more of the thinking about uh, the needs of its own people. You know, uh, during the period of uh, development, uh, a lot, in reality, a lot of the people in China uh, were being used as cheap labor in, in order to build up the, the uh, industrial base. And that's why uh, things are so cheap in America in terms of consumer supplies. Uh, but that's beginning to change in the direction of the uh, Chinese leadership's uh, thinking um, in that they want to improve the situation for the people. So anyway, uh, um, with this kind of uh, backdrop, uh, the U.S. is seeing the China as being uh, a threat now. Uh, they're, 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 they're saying that uh, that period of time when they th thought that China and the U.S. could get along uh, is, uh, is over. And uh, the U.S. government has actually, uh, in pretty much so many words, designated China as an enemy. So you think back to the prior experience of the Japanese internment of the McCarthy era, uh, what you see now is that, hey, this is happening all over again, okay? Uh, I, I, I put down a couple of the articles in Newsweek and the Hoover Institute that provides the intellectual or the media backdrop to build up this kind of thinking. But, you know, if you really think about it, how much of the threat is China to the US. You know, the, one of the things about American media is that it is very slick, powerful, and effective. So much of our own thinking, you know, uh, unless you really uh, dig deep into stuff, if you read the regular newspaper, you and most people are going to come out thinking that, hey, China is a threat. But what you have to do is what, like I said, first of all, look into the context with the history. Secondly, look into the details about what kind of threat does China pose to the US and the rest of the world? Because right now you hear all this stuff about uh, human rights in, in uh, Xinjiang, in uh, Tibet, uh, uh, Tibet trapped in, in Africa and, and Latin America. But in reality, those are just kind of like uh, hyping and dis disinformation, which the U.S. is, is extremely good at. Okay. Uh, basically, what's happening is that the U.S. has set up a situation where they want to get the American public behind the effort of a possible war with China. You know, and this is uh, a great danger, not just to, to China, but to the entire world. Because if something happens, you know, it's so easy for things to do, go nuclear. You know, and this is despite China having a no first use uh, um, uh, promise, unlike the US and Russia. But, you know, before we totally run out of time, um, basically, what, what the U.S. hypes as a threat about China uh, pushing out its borders uh, is untrue. Basically, what China has in terms of its military, its, uh, military outlook is a defensive one. Uh, uh, what we have in reality is you have U.S. bases surrounding China uh, being set up for the possibility possibility of attacking China. You see it in uh, South Korea with the, uh, the, the missile placements, uh, in Japan, uh, Okinawa, uh, Guam, uh, Singapore, uh, and, and even Vietnam. You know, there are bases surrounding China and those are not really for defensive purposes. You know, you hear about South China Sea's uh, um, aggression that's, um, what, what, what do you call it? It's, it, it's 
uh, manipulation of words. Uh, they are defensive facilities. Okay, so basically China's outlook is defensive. It is not offensive. Um, uh, I, I think we're, we're starting to run out of time. So uh, uh, I just ask that people uh, question what you see in the media. Oh, uh, in terms of the coronavirus, uh, a good example about how China is being blamed for coronavirus. Uh, when the U.S. talks about coronavirus, they just uh, focus on December of 2019 when it first started. And they say, oh, China uh, suppressed knowledge about the coronavirus uh, in December when it first came out. But they totally ignore what happened after that. They ignore the fact that uh, the ones who had suppressed the information back in December were disciplined. And they ignore how China actually handled it the rest of the way from January all the way uh, through to the present. And in fact, it was um, just after January 1st, I think it was January 6th, when China released the genome for the coronavirus to the world. So basically I'm saying, don't believe the pro American propaganda. Uh, it's just trying to build up, uh, basically it, it is building up hysteria against Chinese. And uh, the spike of violence against uh, Asians that you see across the country, it cannot be divorced from the fact that China has been demonized. They're, oh, they're related one-to-one. -one. If it weren't for the demonization of China that you see in the media now, you know, despite Biden's statement about uh, protecting Asian Americans, you know, that's the true reason, unless Biden and his foreign policy team of uh, neoconservative war hawks, uh, unlikely uh, uh, will uh, uh, stop demonizing China, uh, the violence against Asian Americans is going to continue. Okay, I, I think I better end it here, Harvey. Okay, okay. thanks, uh, Alvin, uh, Wim, and uh, Jeannie, um, I think there's um, um, you, <clears throat> there was a, a slide of the um, um, Chinese alphabet, alphabetized language society as one of the organizations um, <clears throat> that William and Jeannie's dad participated in, and there was also uh, a uh, mention of Munching, Chinese American Democratic Youth League. And there were, were also uh, uh, organizations that Alvin's uh, father were part of, okay, including uh, organizations that called for US-China relations. Um, and, and then he was also part of uh, the Chinatown establishment at a certain point. Uh, but I was wondering, what was it in the content of their participation that the U.S. was so fearful of, you know, that led to such extreme persecution? You know, was it their views? Was it their, you know, what, what was the activity of Munching? What were the activities of your father that led to this repression? And also what type of message uh, emanated from this repression, okay. Oh, I, I can say something. <clears throat> you know, Munching, um, since we evolved from the alphabetizing group to the Munching, uh, during the, 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 late, the 50s, uh, as far as I can remember, you know, when I was a kid, you know, my dad took us to a lot of the activities that Munching had, and they were more, mainly cultural, and, and uh, uh, cultural activities, basically, or people involved in dancing, singing. Uh, there were study groups for people that uh, wanted to uh, learn mathematics so they can uh, pass tests to get into college. Uh, there was a big push, I guess, because, uh, when, you know, but they, they always had this idea that they always looked at China as a, an example of how um, uh, people should 
uh, you know, I guess behave in terms of their, their, their outlook. Basically, um, like going to school, they emphasize technology. So most of the people involved in Manqing uh, chose careers in, in technology, you know, electronics, uh, science or biology uh, based on the, the um, that, that philosophy. Um, but as far as I, I, I'm concerned, most of the activities that we saw were all based on cultural um, and, and social activities. You know, they had picnics, we went camping at Yosemite uh, a few times. Uh, every year they would go camping at different areas in, in California, at picnics in Golden Gate Park uh, every year. So it's mainly social activities, uh, cultural activities, singing and dancing. I think one time, I think my dad and I went up on, on the stage at Munching there to play the harmonica. I think we played Home Home on the Range or something like that. But uh, again, it's basically it's a social, cultural activities. But why, why were they fearful of this? I, I think the, the government was, was fearful not about the activities that we were involved in, but the, um, the ideas that came, came out of the, um, uh, that were being, not being pushed or anything, that, that I think the main thing was that it had a pro-China stance in terms of looking at the People's Republic of China as a, uh, as a country where the Chinese people have stood up, that they were able to resist the uh, colonialist uh, uh, assault on China and they were able to establish uh, an independent China. And, and that, that in itself was a threat to, to the US government and, and the uh, Taiwanese government. So I think that was the reason they were chosen as uh, targets to be attacked. And so uh, anyway, anybody else have anything else to add? Any? Okay, I'll go, I'll go in then. Um, to me, it was basically hysteria. It was seeing things that weren't there. You know, uh, the, the, the main threat that they saw was that somehow if you're pro-China, you're going to be, you know, <laughs> uh, wanting yeah. to overthrow, overthrow the US government. And that, that was just totally untrue. You know, uh, I, I know for a fact that wasn't my father's intention. Um, basically, all those leftists were, were uh, supportive of China. And by being supportive of China, um, that in itself made them subversive. Although, in fact, that it wasn't. <laughs> it's as simple as that. So, uh, hysteria. I think basically, I think when you are pro-China, pro-communist pro, uh, China, you're taking an anti-colonial stance. You're, you're against imperialism. And I think that's what bothered them. I mean, I mean, after World War II, actually, all the colonies that US and Europe had, you know, I mean, they started to uh, fight for independence. They wanted to be free from uh, colonialism. And so that's actually against their, their interests, you know? So, I mean, I think that's a large part of it. Yeah, okay. Um, oh, good point, Jeannie. Um, one of the main reasons that China had so much support in the uh, so-called undeveloped countries was that China was seen as being a leader of what, what we used to call the third world. Um, and um, I think that's the connection um, uh, that, that can be brought up in terms of uh, the falling dominoes. You know, all these countries are going the wrong way, um, uh, uh, contrary to the direction that uh, the U.S. and the West one. Okay, done. Here's a question um, from one of the students in my class. Uh, would you consider the U.S. diplomatic strategy and Western media portrayal of the Hong Kong protests to be part of the new Red Scare? 
Oh, absolutely. Um, Hong Kong, first of all, going back to history and context again, Hong Kong was taken away during the uh, uh, after opium wars. Oh, yeah. you're right. After the opium war. Okay, so Hong Kong is part of China. Okay. Uh, secondly, um, what happened in terms of Hong Kong was that uh, when Hong Kong reverted back to China, there was an agreement made between the two parties, uh, Britain and the U.S., of one country, two systems. And if you really think about it, what does that mean? What, what the two systems mean meant was that it preserved the colonial mentality that people had in Hong Kong. It, pre, uh, it preserved the infrastructure of the, of the uh, uh, British colonial government. Okay, and, and uh, so, so, you know, like the, all the judges are holdovers, you know, wearing their British wigs and everything uh, in Hong Kong right now. And uh, one of the biggest things that happened even prior to 1997 when Hong Kong was returned was that the U.S. already had established a policy uh, a secret policy, CIA, NED, uh, if people aren't familiar, there's a, an organization called the National Endowment for Democracy. Uh, it's an offshoot of the CIA because uh, back in the 70s, uh, the CIA, CIA got kind of like a dirty name and they broke off the, uh, the uh, what, what would you call it, the, the soft style of, of operations uh, to the NED. These so-called non-governmental organizations uh, were supported in Hong Kong. And the purpose of that was to basically preserve a pro-West mentality and a pro-West um, uh, outpost um, uh, in, the, in, the, uh, in the return uh, to Hong Kong, uh, of Hong Kong to China. So it was kind of like a double-edged sword where uh, legally it was now part of China, but it operated uh, separately from China in terms of its uh, th uh, thinking, especially the educational system. The colonial education system was preserved. Okay? And before I, I take up everybody's time, okay, um, what happened um, uh, in terms of, you know, first of all, a lot of the activists, the protesters during the Hong Kong riots are very honest, they're naive and honest, just like me, William and Harvey were way back when uh, during the third world strike, you know? Um, we didn't really understand everything, you know, uh, looking back, we didn't see plenty of mistakes. Uh, but anyway, the, uh, the Hong Kong post protesters don't have an understanding of history and context. They have this idealized a vision of the US and Britain having democracy. And they think, and this is totally untrue, they think that prior to Hong Kong's return to China, that Hong Kong had democracy under the British. That's pure BS. So uh, what they were fighting for is totally unrelated to the facts. They're, 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 they're protesting on the basis of a myth. Okay, I'll, I'll, I can go on and on, but yes, it's part of the Red Scare. It is part of the, the, the um, media raj of making China look bad. Thank you. Okay. It, it looks oh. like we're running out of time now. Uh, Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we, we, we can stay on for a few more minutes. But uh, Steve Louie, who accumulated and donated the Munching Archives to the Ethnic Studies Library at UC Berkeley has a short announcement to make. Steve? Too much made it. I, my father-in-law was one of the members of uh, Munching, uh, along with William's, William and Jeannie's dad. And when he passed away, we found um, part of the Munching Library we found an almost complete set of their newsletters that, that were published for about 
uh, I might have this wrong, but about seven or eight years at least. Um, and a number of other artifacts, records, uh, tape recordings, things like that. Um, their theater group uh, that, where they did plays, their scripts that they produced. So those were donated to the um, Asian American collection at the Ethnic Studies Library. Um, and, but it's only part of, it's only one of a lot of different members accumulations of things from that period. So that, that was it. So if anybody's interested in any of those things or learning more about Munching, the, uh, the collection is there. I don't think they've been cataloged yet, but they will be um, hopefully soon. Thanks, Harvey. Okay. Thanks, Steve. Yeah, that and the uh, Himart Lai archives. Uh, Himart Lai was also a um, uh, his Chinatown historian and a, um, a leader within the Munching organization. That's all at the uh, Ethnic Studies Library. Okay, so uh, with that, I just want to thank William, uh, Jean, and Alvin for today's presentation. We have a, a comment that from, uh, let's say a direct message comment. Thank you panelists. I learned so much today, okay. And so with that, we'll see you uh, in May for the uh, student presentations, okay. <laughs>